tonight. Trump's triumph. Super Tuesday sees massive victories for both Trump and Biden's campaigns, both inching ever closer to clinching a nomination. But Haley struggles to keep up, only seeing victory in Vermont. Haley heads home. It's the end of the line for Trump's only competitor. No surprises as Haley bids out of the presidential race, leaving the road to the White House a mere clean sweep for Donald Trump. Ceasefire crumbles. Gaza Israel talks on a ceasefire fail to make any progress as Ramadan approaches. The negotiators struggling to keep the two parties at the same table for long. And out of the brick. A hundred Lego creations see a masterful appraisal in London's galleries, bringing to life timeless classics in a brand new style. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Vedana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Welcome to World News Tonight. Thank you very much for joining us as always this evening. We have more updates on the stories that we have kept you informed on over the past few weeks, especially considering the war in Gaza as well. But first, here's the situation on the road to the White House. Well, with Super Tuesday having just concluded, many saw the most expected results at the polls. President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump took big steps towards making their seemingly inevitable rematch official as both notched huge Super Tuesday wins. More than a dozen states held primaries or caucuses yesterday and it was the biggest day of the nominating races so far as the 2024 presidential campaign accelerates and leaves the one-by-one -one march through early voting states behind. Both Biden and Trump saw familiar signs of potential general election weaknesses. Progressives casting ballots for uncommitted rather than Biden and on the Republican side, college-educated suburbanites choosing Haley over Trump. But both also had much more to celebrate as they moved closer to clinching their party's nominations with their near sweeps. U.S. President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump swept to victory in their party's statewide nominating contests on Tuesday, pushing closer to a rematch in the November election that polls show Americans largely don't want. Republican frontrunner Trump brushed aside his last standing rival Nikki Haley as vote tallies showed he was on course to win the support of 14 out of 15 states on Super Tuesday, the biggest day of primaries in the 2024 presidential election cycle. This was an amazing, an amazing night, an amazing day. Former UN Ambassador Haley did secure a surprise win in Vermont. But she no longer has a viable path to nomination, with Trump's commanding performance almost certainly handing him the Republican candidacy for the third straight time. In a victory speech delivered at his Florida estate, Trump focused on Biden's immigration policies and called him the worst president in history. Our states are dying, and frankly, our country is dying, and we're going to make America great again, greater than ever before. In a statement, Biden again cast Trump as a threat to American democracy, saying, quote, Tonight's results leave the American people with a clear choice. Are we going to keep moving forward, or will we allow Donald Trump to drag us backwards into the chaos, division and darkness that defined his term in office? The incumbent president sailed through Super Tuesday on the Democratic side, though in Minnesota, activists opposed to his strong support of Israel appear to have helped drive an even higher number of uncommitted protest votes in the party's primary than they did in Michigan last week. The results are setting up the first repeat U.S. presidential matchup since 1956, but it's one few Americans seem to want. Opinion polls show both Biden and Trump have low approval ratings among voters. A little disappointing that this country is still stuck on the same thing. It's just going to make us look like more of a circus to the rest of the world, which is just disappointing. According to Edison, exit polls in several states, immigration and the economy are top concerns for voters in both parties. 
Meanwhile, it isn't all smiles for Nikki Haley, the former South Carolina governor, who chose not to hold a public event on the evening of Super Tuesday, perhaps reflecting the campaign's belief that there would be little to celebrate from the day's results. She should have held a victory party in Vermont. Despite polls showing her trailing badly in the small northeastern state, Haley actually pulled out a narrow win there, her second victory of the primary season. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Suzanne Shanali from Toronto in Canada. Shanali, what can we expect of the Haley campaign in the future? Is it finally time for us to say goodbye? Anuradhi, the day she seems to bid adieu has turned out to be today. The news is still fresh, but Nikki Haley will reportedly end her long-shot Republican presidential primary bid after losing 14 Super Tuesday contests to Donald Trump. The former South Carolina governor, who became Trump's UN ambassador and the first prominent woman to seek the Republican nomination for president, just delivered remarks near her South Carolina home. The suspension of her campaign was first reported quoting people familiar with her plans, which we are relaying right now. Haley has endured a long string of losses, which began with Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, and our home state of South Carolina. When voters in 15 states cast ballots for Super Tuesday, Haley lost every state apart from Vermont, and she had previously won in Washington, D.C. Among Trump's prominent primary rivals, Haley was the last candidate left standing, so her withdrawal ensures that Trump will capture the Republican nomination. Haley apparently won't announce an endorsement, but will encourage Trump to earn the support of Republican and independent voters who backed her. The move leaves Trump clear to claim the Republican nomination for a third election running despite his legal troubles. Ultimately, though Anuradhi, it seems Haley simply could not convince enough of Republicans it was time to dump Trump. And as you said earlier, it was high time that Haley heads home. Back to you. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Suzanne Shanali from Toronto in Canada. Thanks as always. Well, we're moving on to the update on the situation in Palestine now. It is sour news right now as three days of negotiations with Hamas over a ceasefire in Gaza have failed to make a breakthrough. This comes less than a week before Ramadan, which had been the informal deadline for the said deal. International mediators from the U.S., Egypt and Qatar have been in negotiation with Hamas for a ceasefire in Gaza. The mediators have been trying to come to an agreement where Hamas would release Israeli hostages in return for a six-week ceasefire, the release of some Palestinian prisoners, and more aid to Gaza. But the three days of negotiations failed to make a breakthrough on Tuesday. This comes less than a week before the start of Ramadan, the Muslim fasting month, which had been the informal deadline for a deal. Israel has demanded Hamas hand over a list of captives who are alive, as well as the captive-to-prisoner ratio it seeks in any release deal, to which Hamas has said the group did not have information on which captives were alive or dead. They also said the captives were being held by numerous groups in multiple locations. At a press conference in Beirut on Tuesday, senior Hamas official Osama Hamdan said that his group wants a permanent ceasefire rather than a pause and a complete withdrawal of Israeli forces. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has publicly rejected such demands, pledging that the war would go on until Hamas is dismantled and all the captives are returned. Israel did not send a delegation to the latest round of talks due to Hamas not providing the hostage list. With the fasting month of Ramadan, which starts on March 10th, Hamas negotiators agreed on Tuesday to stay for at least one more day of talks. Palestinian-Israeli violence has spiked during Ramadan in previous years, creating a strong incentive for leaders to reach a deal before next week. We're in India now as thousands of farmers are trying to march once again to the capital Delhi to demand minimum price guarantees for their crops. The farmers had suspended their strike at the end of February after a young farmer died during the protest. To prevent the march, Delhi's borders are actually heavily barricaded and police have been deployed. Farmers are an important voting bloc in the country and analysts say the federal government of Prime Minister Narendra Modi would not want to antagonize them so close to the polls. When the farmers' protest was resumed in the beginning of February, the government had held talks with the unions to stop them from marching to Delhi from the neighbouring states of Punjab, Haryana and Uttar Pradesh. 
Talks with the government broke down at least three times after the authorities could not meet all their demands. Apart from assured pricing, the farmers have also demanded pensions for the elderly and asked the government to waive their debts. The protesters have said the government should double the number of workdays under the Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme from 100 to 200. The farmers also want India to withdraw from the World Trade Organization and scrap all free agreements. And over in China, representatives to the IMF have supported China's ambitious growth goals that were announced yesterday at the two sessions and affirmed that China's economy plays an important role in the world economy and continues to demonstrate vitality and resilience after accounting for one-third of global growth in 2023. The IMF senior representative to China expressed confidence in the country's ability to achieve sustained growth and lauded its efforts in boosting domestic tourism, which is one of the pillars of its economy. According to Barnett, initial findings from Lunar New Year data suggest an increase in travel volumes. Barnett, who has worked on China intimately for two decades, emphasized the development beyond Beijing and Shanghai, mentioning visits to other cities in the country. He noted these cities as modern and thriving, showcasing China's progress. Barnett has been closely monitoring the two sessions, viewing it as a window into China's economic policies. He believes that China's growth fueled by industrial upgrading, coupled with ongoing reforms, will drive global economic momentum. Let's go on for a short commercial break. We'll be back with more key global stories. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We're in South Korea now with an update on the nationwide doctor walkouts reported last week. The government is now rolling out administrative and legal actions against trainee doctors who continue to defy orders to return to work. Meanwhile, police have summoned the spokesperson of the Korean Medical Association's Emergency Committee for questioning earlier this morning, marking the first of five of the scheduled questionings. The government on Wednesday is continuing its administrative measures against trainee doctors who have not returned to work in defiance of a return to work order. Tuesday saw the start of disciplinary action against approximately 7,000 trainee doctors. The health ministry had gathered evidence of their non-compliance during a two-day on-site inspection of 100 major hospitals on March 4th and 5th. The government began sending out preliminary notices about the administrative processes facing these doctors. Following the issuance of notices, doctors will have a two-week period to submit their defenses through written statements. Should administrative actions be upheld, their medical licenses will be suspended for three months. The health ministry is also mulling over whether to file a criminal complaint with police against some junior doctors who led the massive walkout, but the exact details have not yet been decided. Training doctors in South Korea began walkouts on February 20th against the government's planned increase in the medical school admissions quota. As of 8 p.m. on Monday, more than 90 percent of resident doctors, around 8,900, were still absent from their post nationwide. Amid continuing disruption to medical services, five major hospitals in Seoul, including Seoul National University Hospital, said they are exploring the possibility of merging wards to enhance the efficiency of patient care. With the medical system being restructured to focus on patients with critical or emergency needs, there is a plan to treat patients with less urgent conditions in a single ward, much like the approach taken during the COVID-19 pandemic. Other hospitals across the country are also considering either not operating certain medical departments or merging wards. Meanwhile, police on Wednesday summoned Ju Su Ho, spokesperson of the Korean Medical Association Emergency Committee, for questioning. Last Tuesday, the health ministry lodged a formal complaint with police against five officials from the KMA, accusing them of multiple offenses such as violating medical laws and disrupting operations. Following this, police investigators conducted searches at the offices of these five officials and the KMA's emergency committee to collect related evidence, while also imposing travel restrictions on the officials, preventing them from leaving the country. And now in Australia, where the ASEAN summit was underway, as we reported yesterday, Australia's Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has said that the ASEAN-Australia special summit comes during times of fear and uncertainty, adding that the ASEAN bloc matters. 
Albanese spoke to his ASEAN counterparts during his opening remarks at the leaders' retreat hosted at Victoria's government house. For more on this, we have other than the World News special correspondent Vishmi Gamage from Burwood in Australia. Vishmi. Yes, Anuradi. Albanese said both Australia and ASEAN play an indispensable role in maintaining dialogue both in the region and globally. The Australian government announced a $2 billion fund to boost trade and investment in Southeast Asia. The Prime Minister announced the fund to a meeting of Australian and Southeast Asian CEOs along with a further suite of economic initiatives, declaring that Australia is open for business, tourism and trade. He told the gathering that his government is pursuing the most significant upgrade of Australia's economic engagement with ASEAN for a generation. Australia's two-way trade with ASEAN member states exceeded $178 billion in 2022, according to the statement from Albany's office, while two-way investment between two regions amounted to $307 billion. But Canberra clearly sees additional untapped potential in the economic relations between Australia and the 10 nations of ASEAN, which is collectively the world's fourth largest economy. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you very much for the continued updates. That was other than World News Special Correspondent Vishmi Gamage from Burwood in Australia. Thanks again. We're going over now to the Ukraine war front as Ukraine-Russia conflict continues to escalate. Ukrainian drones have hit and sunk a Russian Black Sea Fleet patrol ship off occupied Crimea. This was actually according to the Ukrainian military, which also released video footage of the event. It said that the Sergei Kotov was hit overnight after a special unit named Group 13 fired marine drones. The attack took place near the Kerch Strait, which connects the Sea of Azov to the Black Sea. The Ukraine military announced on messaging app Telegram that it caused damage estimated to be worth around $65 million. A Navy spokesperson has since said the vessel, quote, is on the seabed as a result of fire damage by unmanned boats. Unable to verify the reports, the Russian Defence Ministry did not immediately reply to his request for comment. Some Russian military bloggers confirmed the account, with one Telegram channel reporting attempts to tow the ship to port, but said it eventually sank. Ukraine has in recent months stepped up attacks in the Black Sea and on Crimea, which Russia seized and annexed in 2014. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said in November that Kyiv had taken the initiative in the area and forced back Russia's fleet. The price of Bitcoin, the largest cryptocurrency by market cap, have reached a new all-time high today. And many remain optimistic that the cryptocurrency may reach even more new highs, driven by its spot ETF approval. The price of Bitcoin continues to soar, this time reaching an all-time high on Tuesday. According to U.S. crypto exchange Coinbase, the price of one Bitcoin hit 69,225 U.S. dollars as it surged to 4% in 24 hours. That meant the largest cryptocurrency by market cap surpassed a previous record of $68,990 set in November 2021 before profit taking led to prices falling below $60,000 at one point. Still, Bitcoin has surged 160% since last October and has risen more than 40% in February alone. Bitcoin has also gone up nearly 400% since November 2022, when it plummeted to the $16,000 range due to the collapse of the Terra USD and Luna, as well as the bankruptcy filed by virtual currency exchange FTX. Bitcoin's all-time high was largely driven by the U.S. regulators' approval of the spot exchange-traded fund and large-scale capital inflow through it. In January, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission approved 11 spot ETFs applied by BlackRock, the world's largest asset management company. According to Bloomberg News, since the introduction of the Bitcoin ETF, the net inflow through BlackRock and Fidelity Investments amounted to $7.35 billion but also driving up the prices is the Bitcoin halving in April. With the total supply of Bitcoin set at 21 million, of which 19 million have already been mined, once the split occurs, the rewards given to miners will also be reduced by half. Some economists say that the easing of sentiment toward risky assets, the New York stock market hitting an all-time high, and the expectation that the U.S. Fed will cut interest rates 
all contributed to Bitcoin's rise and may continue to push its prices higher. Well, it seems more work lies ahead for Boeing to get back on course. The Federal Aviation Administration has said that it had found numerous issues with production at Boeing and supplier Spirit Aerosystems. Its audit found multiple instances where the companies failed to comply with manufacturing quality control requirements. The FAA also said it found, quote, non-compliance issues in Boeing's manufacturing process control, parts handling and storage, and product control. The FAA has not detailed the corrective actions Boeing and Spirit must take, but sent a summary of its findings to the companies in its completed audit. Spirit Aerosystems, which makes the fuselage for the MAX, said it is, quote, in communication with Boeing and the FAA on appropriate corrective actions. Boeing said that with the audit findings, they now had a, quote, clear picture of what needs to be done. The FAA's audit was prompted by January's mid-air blowout on an Alaska Airlines 737 MAX 9. Regulators later barred the plane maker from increasing production of the aircraft. Last week, following a meeting with Boeing CEO Dave Calhoun, FAA Administrator Mike Whitaker said Boeing must develop a comprehensive plan to address, quote, systemic quality control issues within 90 days. Whitaker said the plan must incorporate results of the audit and findings from an expert review panel report released last week. Let's go in for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. More news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We have a very artsy story to report to you tonight. Over 100 Lego sculptures made up of over a million bricks are now being showcased at the Art of the Brick exhibition in London. Artist Nathan Sawaya has spent nearly 20 years of his life gluing together these tiny bricks to create reimagined versions of some of the world's most famous art pieces, such as Michelangelo's David, Van Gogh's Starry Night and Da Vinci's Mona Lisa. Among the well-known pieces like Edward Munch's The Scream and Rodin's The Thinker, visitors will also find original creations such as a dinosaur skeleton and a torso ripping its chest open with thousands of yellow Lego bricks spilling out. It's very clear that this artist wanted all beholders to see the pure magic that simple Lego bricks can create. And finally tonight, when we are pestered by something, we usually call it a fly in our face. What with the annoyance that the creatures bring about in our daily lives, especially in a climate like ours, where they spawn seemingly out of nowhere. Well, it seems that even flies can have a use in the near future. What exactly for? Grossly enough, for food. You don't usually think of flies as being something anyone would actually want, but this lab in London is breeding them by the millions. It turns out black soldier flies may be a good food source for farm animals. EntoCycle's CEO told, It is the quickest, cheapest, most sustainable insect to farm, and it's a non-disease, non-pest species that's found all over the world. The bugs are packed with protein. Yum and they can feed on food waste. That means they may be more sustainable than a lot of other animal feeds. Right now, we cut down rainforests to produce soy, we overfish the oceans to catch fish meal, and then they get turned into protein feed that gets shipped all over the world again to feed the animals. It's incredibly unsustainable. EntoCycle is a startup in the UK that wants to bring bug breeding to farmers around the world. Their machines can count fly eggs fast. You can't farm insects if you don't know how many insects you have. And so it's really important to have it at that kind of key level when you are managing billions in real time. The larvae are fattened up on food waste and then packaged into animal feed. It's being touted as the livestock feed of the future. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty smart way of recycling all this stuff and making it useful. Useful, yes. Appetizing, well, let's just say we're glad these are for farm animals and not people. Flies for food. What else will scientists make edible in the future? I'm really scared to find out. Well, that's all the stories we have for you tonight. We'll see you again tomorrow with more updates on the happenings of the world. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.